Today, we will meet a former U.S. Navy rescue swimmer. We will talk about his struggles with PTSD and an important project with him and an Aggie filmmaker. We will also see how acupuncture and other treatments for people can help our four-legged friends. All that and more on this episode of Around Texas. Everything is bigger in Texas. The Texas A&M University system is no exception. Bigger plans, bigger ideas. We strive to make a bigger difference across the Lone Star State and around the world. 11 universities, eight state agencies, one mission, working every day to build a brighter tomorrow. Meet the people striving to make a Texas-sized difference every day across the A&M system. Welcome to Around Texas with Chancellor John Sharp. An Aggie filmmaker followed his friend, a Navy veteran with PTSD, on a dangerous sailboat voyage around Cape Horn and made a documentary about the excursion. The film chronicled the harrowing passage, but more than anything, it's about a search for healing. In this segment, we'll meet the filmmaker as well as the veteran who made it his mission to help his fellow warriors who returned home in one piece yet still suffer from the invisible wounds of war. So Taylor and I kind of came up with the idea for this journey, and he reached out because he discovered some of my writing online. Um, and at that point, I was continuing a project that I began at Texas A&M University. So that involved interviewing combat veterans from Iraq and Afghanistan, and was writing my dissertation um, on the process of veterans returning to the civilian world after they get out of the military. I sent him a message and I was like, dude, how are you getting this so right? You know, how, you weren't in the military, how, how does this happen? You know, these stories you're writing are, are so accurate and real. And uh, I really felt them, you know, and, and he told me all the research he'd been working on. One of the most shocking statistics that I came across in my research is that the most dangerous year of a military personnel's life is their first year out of the military. PTSD isn't limited to combat veterans. It's almost across the board. It's first responders. And what Taylor was doing as a rescue swimmer was exactly that. He was a first responder, search and rescue. It just came on strong, man. And I didn't understand it, didn't know why. And Steven was the only person I could think of to call that might have seen something like this before. And sure enough, you know, I called him. And I was like, dude, what the hell's going on with my body, man? I don't, I don't know what, what to do, what's happening. And he's like, everything you're going through and telling me right now is I've heard from every single person I've interviewed. And in that moment, I was like, dude, I'm not the only one going through this, you know? Um, but it's a shame that I'm the only one that has Steven to tell me that. When I came home over winter break, Taylor visited me and he told me about attempting to commit suicide and he pulled the bullet out of his pocket and it had a dent um, on the back of it. And that was an incredibly jarring moment. You know, this was not only one of my peers, um, but one of my best friends and somebody who I cared about deeply. And I wanted to help him and I was trying to help him and, and yet that happened. Um, and that was, I think, for both of us when we realized that this trip needed to be more than just us sailing. And that issue became incredibly personal for both of us at that point. That's when we decided to make it about something bigger, to make it about raising awareness for veterans back in the States and that whole transition process from the military into the civilian world. We kind of set out with the goal of, of filming my experiences and talking about Steven's research and posting YouTube videos and stuff to, to try and reach the veteran community and let them know that they're not alone. The plan was to leave from Pensacola, Florida and sail down the Caribbean through the Panama Canal and then down the west coast of South America. Once we had kind of settled on a documentary, we knew that we didn't want it to just be a documentary that raised awareness about something. We wanted it to be a documentary that had a call to action, that left people feeling like they needed to do something to help correct what is, you know, 22 suicides a day for veterans. It is directly correlated with parts of the brain that exist, you know, that are tied to memory. And so if you can 
kind of reshape your brain in a way to to be releasing these these hormones and endorphins that would normally have been released in a negative setting, you know, um, now in a positive one, I think that that can really help moving forward for veterans. About halfway through the trip, um, I realized there was something to it that I was more conscious of what my body needed and what it was going through. PTSD doesn't leave you, it doesn't go away, but you can live a healthy life with it. And that's that's kind of thing. It's not like a one-time cure-all all thing. It's it's something you manage and you live with and you, you find a healthy way to do that. For me, that's when I realized sailing was working. Sailing is, is a very adrenaline inducing activity, especially when storms are involved. Early on, um, we quickly realized that if we're in a storm, it's either drop the camera and pick up a line or die. When we got back from Cape Horn, um, it was about February of 2019. So it's been almost three years since we finished that trip and we finished filming. So post-production for this documentary has been a long and arduous journey, you know, um, longer even than the sailing journey itself. Yeah, we were super naive on how uh, everything that goes into making a film when we got back. I was telling people, yeah, we'll have the film done by summer. <laughs> 2019. <laughs> that's what I thought it was, but it, that's not the case. Um, it takes a lot of money and fundraising to, to finish a film. We finished the film um, in the middle of the pandemic. That uh, did not help us getting it out into the world. Uh, we, we had some serious setbacks because of that, but now we, we've We've launched it, we premiered it in New York City on the Intrepid, and it's been showing kind of on a almost weekly basis around the country. There's still so much more work to be done. This film, I think, deserves a national platform. And right now, um, we've got great local support. The Aggie Network has been incredible to us, uh, but we are trying to elevate this film and, and to get it out there in front of as many people as possible. Well, we started uh, American Odysseus Sailing Foundation two years ago, right when COVID started. Um, the guy started this nonprofit with Cameron Album. He was in the Marines and uh, he's medically retired. You know, he had kind of the same story I did. And then we started doing these screenings and we'd go to these different communities around the country and talk about PTSD and what we did and what we saw. And uh, it relit the fire inside of me for, for real. Because um, the questions you get after the film rolls is, how do I take care of my niece or nephew coming home? My son's deployed right now. You know, how should we take care of him whenever he comes home? And uh, how can we implement these programs in our community here? You know, you get questions like that. I'm like, all right, man, people people care. You know, people want to make a difference and, and actually change this and stop veteran suicide. So, you know, we get to talk about what adventure therapy does and um, all the programs around the States, because it's not just sailing. When I first saw the documentary, and I actually watched the whole through, I've seen it like five times now, but I could relate to it. It hits and then you really realize that no matter what you think, you're not going through it alone. And that's kind of what most veterans think. They think, hey, look, I'm not gonna say anything because now I'm weak or you know, nobody else deals with it, when it's quite the opposite. A lot of people deal with the same outcomes. There's no one that teaches you anything about it or prepares you for it. So you just kind of wing it, then you act like you're fine being around another vet still and it just it put me in a good spot so that was when I actually made the decision I was like you know what I'm gonna come down here and help you all out now I'm just gonna you know, sell everything and move here what we've managed to do is we've created a feature documentary that is incredible you know and it's an incredible collaboration between creatives in the film industry and in animation and music composition um, the people who've gotten involved in this film have done it you know, if not for free, then at an incredibly discounted rate. And it's because they have this passion for this issue and they want to help call attention to this issue and raise awareness and they want to tell this story. The goal for this, for all of this, has been the goal since day one is to get as many veterans out as we can and talk to them about what they're going through and show them if they don't know already, like I didn't know, that you can heal, that your mind can heal, your body can heal over time. We're gonna keep doing this as long as we can. So Stephen, it's been three years since you guys sailed around Cape Horn. Tell me about what's happened since then. Honestly, a lot has happened. Um, you know, that's one thing we didn't necessarily anticipate was 
post-production for a documentary could take that long. The pandemic certainly didn't help, you know. Um, but personally, Taylor and I, we've, we've had our own kind of separate journey since we've gotten back. So Taylor's gone on, um, he's, he's helped found the American Odysseus Sailing Foundation. And that takes veterans out on sailing trips as a part of therapy for them. And um, just to kind of like, you know, introduce them to the sailing life and to the water and to the therapy that helped Taylor, right? Um, so Cameron, a guy who heard about our journey and our trip, he owned a boat and he sailed down to Galveston and they're working on this together. Um, but Taylor's also launched a tequila company. So he's called it Cape Horn Tequila after our trip and rounding Cape Horn. And he wants to use the revenue and the profits from that to help fund sponsoring veterans to go on sales. Um, and he's also had a daughter. So that's a big, that's a pretty big life event for him. And then for me, you know, I got back and my book was published in 2020. Um, I got married and I've actually, you know, I've been freelance writing and then I've been trying to transition into film some more. So this, the documentary experience really opened my eyes to the potential for visual storytelling. And that's been something that's been really interesting. Well, how do you see this film helping people with PTSD? I mean, I think it's gonna help in a lot of ways. For one, we're destigmatizing PTSD. So Taylor had PTSD. He went on this incredible voyage. He's helping others, you know, he's fully capable. That's not even a question, um, but it's also education. So when Taylor got out of the military, he had no idea what was happening. He didn't understand it. And just learning why he was experiencing some of the symptoms that he was and that it wasn't gonna last forever was a huge game changer for him. And well, what can normal, regular people do to help? Well, you know, I think this documentary was always meant to be a call to action. And so um, one of the responses that we've gotten pretty much at every single screening we've done is the question, what can I do to help? And this documentary was meant to be a grassroots movement. It's supposed to reach people. It's supposed to make them feel that way. Um, and so regular people can, they can watch the film, but they can also just, you know, they can try and engage with veterans and try and empathize with their experiences and what they've been going through. So y'all had a screening of your documentary of the film uh, on the aircraft carrier Intrepid. How was that different from, from just a regular movie theater? Oh man, I mean, that was incredible. So if, that was the world premiere of the documentary. We flew up to New York, there was press, they rolled out the red carpet. Um, it was quite the experience, but um, as far as how it's different from just a regular theater, you know, they had, it was a, it was a big stadium seating, 250 person velvet drapes on either side of the screen and the sound. I mean, we, we showed it in theaters across the country and they, what they've done is they've turned the elevator where they pulled the ships up into a stadium theater and it's it's really incredible so it was all below deck right yeah, yeah. yeah it was below wow. deck it was on the intrepid um, before the show we got to go on deck and look at some of the planes that was my first time ever being on the intrepid so wow. it was really an incredible experience well congratulations on a, on a cause that's helping a lot of people well thank you When I first heard about animals getting acupuncture, I thought it sounded like something happening in a place like Los Angeles. But as it turns out, it's happening here in Aguiland. It might sound crazy, but scientists at Texas A&M's veterinary school are proving that many of the procedures that have been reserved for humans also work well on animals. I do think traditionally veterinary medicine and human medicine were pretty siloed and separate. And I think over the last 20 years there's been a much better understanding about how much we can learn from the human field and in turn how much the human field can learn from us. So probably over the last five years we've seen an amazing amount of outreach from human medical doctors, from scientists at medical schools. They're trying to learn from veterinary medicine, from techniques we've already developed, 
but they're also very, very interested in developing therapies and then advancing them to help both humans and veterinary patients. We refer to that as translational medicine. For me, the translational medicine idea just builds into this one health concept, which is we're all able to support and improve each other. And if somebody has some expertise and they're willing to share it across these traditional professional boundaries, everybody benefits. So even in my career, I've seen those barriers kind of disappear. We have much stronger relationships with MDs who do similar procedures. There's a lot more conversation in the sharing of ideas. Some things are now pioneered in small animals and then translated back into the human field. And the things that we're going to be able to provide in the next, even the next decade, are tremendously exciting. Practicing acupuncture in an environment like Texas A&M, quite honestly, has been phenomenal. We really don't teach acupuncture and chiropractics in veterinary school. I have found that once people actually see it in action and see you really make a change, acceptance comes incredibly quickly. Acupuncture, chiropractics are certainly things that originated in people that have been moved into animal medicine. And it is focused a lot on wellness and restoring homeostasis and allowing that animal to kind of heal itself through um, interventions in both acupuncture or chiropractics. Um, in our food animal species, we have a very limited ability, um, very few drugs that are legal and licensed for pain control. We do see animals that often have chronic pain um, that people want to or need to keep alive. So finding a way to deal with pain was really my first impetus to going into acupuncture. I get involved when somebody else has an animal that has failed to get better by Western standards and they're wondering whether or not there's something acupuncture or chiropractics can bring to the table that may change um, the trajectory or the outcome of that animal. We do see people who come back for it. Um, we see people who recognize the value and the change in their animals when we have added that to their treatment protocols. It is an awesome place to be where you are part of a group that continually pushes the envelope on what we can do for animal welfare and animal care. One of the great things about being at Texas A&M is the culture here is to be the best. And so that does sometimes mean significant investment. We want to be out in front pioneering new ideas. And we're very, very lucky to have the support we need to do that. I think over the last decade or so, we've really moved forward with the things that we're able to offer our patients. So we now offer a range of minimally invasive procedures. Most often they use what's called image-guided systems, which is usually a movie x-ray, and that lets us look inside the patient real time. And using tiny devices, we can reach parts of the body that we couldn't reach otherwise. So the term for the movie x-ray really is fluoroscopy and we use a foot pedal so we can activate the x-ray machine and then we can actually see where our devices are inside the patient while we do a procedure. And that lets us do things like put stents in ureters that are blocked by a stone. We can reroute blood flow that's not going the correct direction to the liver. We can put cardiac devices into the heart. It's pretty amazing what we can do with this technology. So many of the procedures that we're now able to offer here are pretty new to veterinary medicine. The development side from the human aspect has been going on probably for about 30 or 40 years. It's just more recently we've had access to the technology to bring these things into our practice. Well, some of the amazing benefits of these procedures are the recovery time. So rather than patients having large surgeries that have to open them up all the way to get access to somewhere tricky, we can get to places with a guide wire and the device and leave basically no mark at all on the animal. The other thing that's really clever is sometimes we had no traditional surgical options and now we have minimally invasive options so we can actually treat patients that say 10 or 15 years ago we would just have had to say I'm sorry there's nothing we can do. So it's, it's a wider range of things that we can offer and then the recovery times often are minimal. Some of our patients are home the same day after highly technical procedures. There are a few other veterinary schools in the US who have interventional radiology and endoscopy services, but there are pretty few and far between. And so what we're doing here at Texas A&M really is pushing things forward. We offer procedures that nobody else in the state even offers. 
We have many of our clients who drive in from, from other states, from Louisiana, from Colorado. But just to know that we made a difference makes all of us just feel great. You know, in order to advance excellence in anything, you need a core of very committed people that are outstanding and want to move the needle. And we're at a place right now where we have that core across a variety of different disciplines. And there is a huge focus on improving techniques for our patients right now, uh, whether that's through minimally invasive surgeries or interventional procedures. There's also a huge focus on advancing therapies that would help pets, large animals, and humans. Colossus is a 20-year-old Clydesdale. I've had him a few years. Caesar is a miniature horse and is about six years old. When Caesar came, he wouldn't stay with the minis. He kept going under the fence, hanging with the big guy. <laughs> that was the very beginning of a special friendship. We take them to Texas A&M vet school every five to six weeks to get Colossus's hooves trimmed and shoes replaced. And here comes Caesar along with him. He's gone to where he doesn't want to go anywhere without Caesar. We load Colossus and Caesar up in the trailer and he, Colossus will look back for his buddy to come into the trailer. He, he looks and then Caesar comes aboard and he does okay. I mean, you think this Colossus is this big giraffe horse, and he has this little mini, and it's his, uh, it's his security blanket. <laughs> Colossus and Caesar's relationship is very similar to how humans have emotional support animals. You know, I didn't own a Colossus when he was younger. So I don't know what he's been through. You know, I can see the compassion and the love for people, but for him to need Caesar to come with him as a support system, you know, I really, you don't know what, what, what they experience. I think what's so appealing about translational medicine to our veterinarians, our referring veterinarians, our pet owners, is uh, really the ability to advance care. It is amazing to work with team members that are as passionate as I am. And we've got such a diverse campus with so many different expertise. And I think we're just starting to tap into that as a college. And I can't wait to see what the future holds in, uh, in that arena. Doctor, the idea of using human medicine techniques in animals is interesting. Tell us all about that. Well, I think veterinary medicine and human medicine have been very closely tied, um, really, for the entirety of both those two fields. And more and more over the last 10 years, we're seeing therapies from human medicine moving into the animal space that are really, really advanced. And those range from minimally invasive surgeries to radiation therapy um, to new drugs as well. What kind of dialogue is there between veterinarians and uh, medical doctors with regard to translational medicine? So I think it's a, it's a really interesting two-way dialogue. The first direction is treatments that are already established in people and how do we adapt those into animals? So for example, something like a, a lithotripsy for a bladder stone to remove it minimally invasively, very well established in human medicine. And now um, it's becoming more and more frequent in veterinary medicine. I think the other really intriguing part of that dialogue is taking treatments from the laboratory that are often being developed at human medical schools and trying to utilize animals that have naturally occurring diseases to advance those treatments in both veterinary medicine and human medicine. Now at the vet school to do this, are there medical doctors that are now embedded in the, in the vet school to, to do this? We don't have medical doctors that are embedded in the vet school per se, but we work very, very closely with institutions like Texas A&M Health Science Center, Baylor College of Medicine, MD Anderson, 
to um, explore moving treatments between both species. I think what makes it really, really innovative uh, is the opportunity to advance care very rapidly. So traditionally, when a drug's being developed, there is a series of clinical trials. They start in the laboratory. It moves into human patient care very, very slowly. And there's a high failure rate for new drugs, up to 90% of candidate drugs that even make it to human trials don't pass muster. So how do we accelerate that? And I think that's where the veterinary school has an incredible role to play. And we can accelerate it by enrolling patients, dogs, cats, horses, that have naturally occurring diseases that are very similar to human diseases in clinical trials that are really well designed. And these trials offer win-win opportunities. So our clients get access to these incredible new therapies for diseases that are really hard to treat. And you don't have the red tape of the FDA to yes. go through it. So by the time you send it to Baylor College of Medicine, you got a pretty good idea that this stuff works, right? Yes, exactly. So it speeds innovation and it weeds out the drugs that aren't gonna work. Good. Well, thank you very much for being here and thank you for uh, what you're doing at Texas A&M. Uh, thank you. Wonderful opportunity, appreciate it. The unique spirit and traditions that make Texas A&M University a place like no other are deeply rooted in the core of cadets. Established in 1876 along with the university, the core is the most visible part of Texas A&M's rich history. These are their stories. Parsons Mounted Cavalry was formed in 1973. There are currently 66 horses, seven mules, and over 70 cadets in the cavalry. Cadets in this unit are trained in basic horsemanship skills. On game days, the cab rides from Fiddler's Green to campus to participate in March into Kyle Field. The cab is also responsible for the care and maintenance of the three-inch field gun, known as the Spirit of O2. The cannon is used to signal touchdowns during football games and to kick off other special events around campus. Parsons Mounted Cavalry represents Texas A&M at parades and other equestrian events across the state and nation. This is the Corps of Cadets at Texas A&M University. Breaking Away, how the Texas A&M system changed the game, chronicles a decade of system milestones and the people who achieved them. Available from major book retailers and the Texas A&M University Press.